Yeah, th thank you uh, for coming to my talk. And my, uh, I work in Intel's uh, open source technology centers, and my responsibility actually is a Linux uh, performance engineer. So I look uh, uh, mostly at uh, the kernel performance and trying to tune Linux and make it better. Um, okay. If you look at any open source uh, projects, the, the one beauty about open source project is it's never static and it's constantly changing. And the good thing about change is um, you can always throw in new features and you can uh, fix any bugs very quickly and uh, you can accommodate uh, user requests and, and also because it's open, so, uh, you can get new developers coming and contribute the code. So that's all the good things about uh, the open source project. But being open also carries uh, baggage with it. First thing is like you have overworked uh, maintainers. Like, the, Maintainers are swamped with uh, patches that come in, so maintainer may not do the best jobs in filtering out say all the bad patches from from the good patches. So so that's one thing, and the other thing is the those people that uh, contribute to the code. You have also new uh, developers coming in. They may not know all the intricacies about the code, and they may do something that they think is right but actually broke. Uh, broke the code. And uh, the, the third thing is, as you add more and more code, more and more features uh, into your code, your code path actually gets longer and longer. So over time, there's a, a force that slowly pushed the code to get slower and slower and slower. So that's, that's the other thing. And so how do you... Uh, guarantee that your, your code still works well like after that many years. So that's kind of the questions that we are dealing with. Um, being a kernel's uh, performance engineer, so I looked at the, the kernel itself. And um, kernel is, the Linux kernel is one of the largest uh, open source projects uh, out there. And it's, it's used uh, almost everywhere. If you have an Android phone, it runs on the Linux kernel. So let's look at the amount of changes that you're dealing with uh, for Linux kernel. Um, so this is a very recent uh, release that we're going from the 3.13 kernels to the 3.14 kernels. And there are uh, about a two months development uh, cycles. There are 70, day, uh, 70 development days and there are one, uh, 12, about 12,000 patches that go into this release. So that's the rate of 176 changes commit um, uh, per day, and it translates to about seven changes per hour. So if you are poor kernel performance engineers like me and trying to keep things that keep up with the amount of changes, and this is how it feels like. <laughs> You're like drinking from a fire hose, like, um, and <clears throat> This, these are the things that we're trying to, um, um, to ensure. So there is no build and boot errors. Um, and you know that the, the kernels has a lot of build config options. In fact, over 6,000 of them in the kernels. So you have to make sure that you tweak all those config options boots. Yeah. And also there's no build errors and um, to make things even worse, like the kernels are um, works on many different architecture, not just on the x86 architecture that we care about, but it actually also runs on ARMs and MIPS and Alpha, blah blah blah, that lots of other architectures. On top of that, you want to make sure that there's no performance regression, so your code don't slows down, and you want to do it every nine minutes. So <laughs> and that makes you want to cry. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so this is how I got, uh, into, got started into the uh, Linux performance uh, project. So here's like uh, our marketing people like, coming in, and they, they try to get um, a new customers to switch 
to uh, uh, new Intel CPUs, and it, uh, it says, yeah, let's, let's use this new, uh, you want to switch to this new CPU because it has this new XYZ spanking CPU features. Uh, but <coughs> our customers go ahead and um, turn on uh, this um, a newer versions of the OS that, ha that supports this new CPU features. And then they come back to us and say, oh gosh, um, my apps got slower. What's, yeah, what's the problem with it? Yeah. And, <clears throat> and then this becomes my problem. But the marketing, marketing people are actually not, um, not too concerned about it. They'll tell the customer, yeah, your, your app will slow down 10%, but you see this new CPU will run 50% faster. Yeah. That's how you, we, we get you to upgrade your PCs, right? <laughs> but um, <clears throat> but being a performance engineer, I, I can do that. Yeah, I have to actually look at what what is causing the uh, the performance of the code to go slower. And if I look at the code, there's almost like when oftentimes like the customers are using uh, switching from between major releases uh, uh, of the distribution, like a Red Hat three to Red Hat four, that's, that's the year 2005 time. And almost three years worth of changes into the kernels and there are over 200,000 patches like um, between those two versions. And where do we even start to look for, for things that's wrong? Okay. <clears throat> so one good thing is um, in the year 2005, um, the Linux source code um, changes from uh, going, being managed under uh, BitKeeper to Git, okay? And that is wonderful. The reason is because Git has a feature called bisect. <clears throat> and with bis bisect, you can very easily group your patches into two groups, yeah. So with that, with that capability, then you can test, okay, you divide your patches into two groups, and you test and see whether it, you are in the good group or the bad group. And, and so <clears throat> with, uh, uh, with bisect, 200,000 patches, you can bisect down to the bad patch in 18 tests. So that's not too bad. You know. That's something we can deal with. So I'll give you an example of the uh, bisect. <clears throat> so let's say that um, you know that this this is this is a good um, uh, good code, and then there, there are uh, probably about eight commits in between, and, and then you are testing on uh, uh, on the patch K, okay, that that already has that B C D E F G H I, like all those patches uh, inside. And then you know that, oh gosh, it's, it's bad. So you start uh, bisecting. So first thing you do is you, you choose the midpoint, okay, here. And you, you test that midpoint. And then you, you know, actually the, the problem is right here. So you test the, the midpoint and then you, and then you realize that, oh, that's, that's bad. Okay, so, so you know that this group of patches are bad. So, you do the bisect again, so you narrow yourself down to this group of patches, and you find that, oh, that's still bad. Then you bisect again, pick this point. Oh, that, that one is good. Then you know that you are only left with um, patch C, and so patch C is, the, is a bad patch. So that's the first uh, bad uh, commit. <coughs> So instead of doing searching for the the problems in a, serially, now you actually do it. Uh, you can do it in log n uh, amount of time. <coughs> so that's that's all one wonderful, yeah. And um, but we, you are inclined to declare victory, but life is always pretty messy. Okay, the the reason is is because. <clears throat> um, there are a lot of built problems uh, in, inside the, the, the kernel still. So if you pick uh, the point F, it doesn't necessarily build. 
and if it, even if it built, it doesn't necessarily boot. Okay. <laughs> so so then there there's a lot of uh, gymnastics you have to do. So it tries to okay now no move the bisect point maybe one one patch before or one patch after, and, and tries tries to find a, a, a good point where um, uh, to to try to test against. <clears throat> so that's I'll come to that okay later. Yeah. Uh, first, I uh, want to show you the um, development cycles of the uh, Linux kernels. <clears throat> so usually, usually this is where um, people submit the patches uh, to the mailing list and to say that, oh yeah, we, I, I think uh, uh, we can do X, Y, Z, uh, it will enable uh, great features. And then the back and forth discussion, uh, this may take months, weeks, or even years, okay? And finally, the uh, system uh, um, maintainers will say, yeah, okay, the, the, the code is good, and accept the code into history. Um, and, and then this will usually sit there and marinate, <coughs> uh, depends, sometimes depends on uh, whether the, the maintainer thinks that your, your patch is, is ready or not. It, ca it can take months okay, to, to sit here. And then when, when the maintainer thinks that, yeah, the, the patch is kind of ready to go, they will move the patch to an uh, integration tree called the Linux Next tree. And, and then uh, Linus, uh, uh, Linus Tobo say probably once every two months, like, he will try to start a new major uh, release of the Linux kernels. And, and then he will, he will pick the, the patches from the sub the uh, or the Linux next tree and, and then merge them all together and forms a new version. Yeah. And he will release something called the uh, release candidate one. Okay. And this process takes two months. Yeah. Usually they are about uh, usually about six to eight release candidates uh, before uh, Linus thinks that yeah, uh, the the kernel is good enough and and release it, and then <clears throat> from then on, uh, oh, is kind of frozen. But but there's something called a stable release kernels where like uh, really important like stability related uh, critical uh, fixes that like, go into the kernels. Like this is the. Uh, Uh, st uh, stable kernels, and, and then that will be picked up by, um, you have some enthusiast uh, distribution like Fedora's, OpenSUSE, and all that. And usually that, that uh, has a new release every six months or, or so. So every six months or so, you have a new. And finally, after maybe like every two years, like Red Hat will, will release a, a new, new version. Oh, so, so this is kind of the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the pic overall picture, and if you detect the problems over in the production, okay, then it takes a you the the problems have been sit sitting there for already for a very long time, and it is one thing also say if you detect the problems there and, and other th things to actually fix the problems because <clears throat> it is hard. It is a lot harder to get a major distribution like Red Hat to, to, fix, to fix the problem. Um, it, they would need to go through their QA process, blah, 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 and, and, and all that. And, and it takes a long time. Yeah. So <clears throat> um, at 2005, when we started uh, the kernel performance project, we look at this picture here, and then we scratch our head and say, OK. So what should we do to, uh, where should we start testing? So we pick, we don't want us to pick this, this part of the development cycles to do our testing because each, there are just too many uh, code trees uh, to, to test. Uh, each subsystem maintainer has his own trees and that's, <coughs> it's not manageable. So we say, okay, 
let's do this. Uh, let's test when Linus first started uh, the release candidate kernels. And there's uh, two months with Windows, and we can go in and do, do the testing and try to catch the problem there. <clears throat> so, so we move, try to move the problem detect detection from the productions into the development cycle. <clears throat> So for between 2005 and 2011, we start re regular testing of each release candidate. And we do that about once every two weeks and tries to catch the problem before it affects the general users. And we are kind of uh, successful in doing that. Like we, <clears throat> for each um, release, I mean, for each major release, we are able to catch on average about like five performance regressions. Uh, and <clears throat> I have an old picture that, sh that shows you the testing process that we have. So we have a bunch of uh, performance tests, about uh, 130 of them. And then we feed that into our um, uh, testing framework. And our testing framework will actually go and check the uh, kernel.org and see if a new uh, kernel is being released every 30 minutes it goes and poll pull the website. And once it detects that, oh, a, a new kernel comes out, it will kick off the, uh, our test script, which is a bunch of bash sc shell scripts. And it's not, not, nothing very fancy over there. So. <clears throat> and then send it to our test boxes. Yeah. And after about like, 5 to 18 hours, we get our results back. And it goes into the uh, database. Where so we have a web interface, so so we'll come in uh, the day after the uh, a new kernel has been released, and we will look at the, uh, the graphs there for for each of the benchmark and see if there is a big performance dip for any of them. <clears throat> if there is, then we will start to do some uh, analysis. Okay, so some of the tools that we have to do the analysis is. We have something like a flight recorder as we uh, run the benchmark. It collects a bunch of uh, statistics, like VM stats, uh, the profiles of like, how much uh, each function is uh, being called, and uh, I.O. statistics, and a ho whole bunch of things. So this is kind of our flight recorder. So we'll look at that and get, try to get some clue of uh, where, where things go wrong. <clears throat> and we will also. Um, start doing bisect, okay, trying to locate the, the problem. And sometimes we may need to rerun uh, the, the benchmark again, especially if it is some benchmark that has uh, a lot of variation. <clears throat> so this is kind of what we did for um, maybe six years or so. And it was still far from ideal, and because uh, Usually, most of the changes coming in the first release candidates. That's where it's that you have like over ten thousand patches that that uh, all appear. Um, and the other thing that's not ideal is that we 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 are only testing every two weeks. So most of the times, our test machines are kind of sitting there idle. Yeah. So we are kind of wasting re resources there. And the other thing is we're only testing for performance problems, but actually a lot of the times uh, build problems like in the kernels. And also, <clears throat> um, there might be a lot of, if, if you run the uh, compilers, there are warnings and those kind of things that we, we totally missed. Um, and there are also static code analysis tool that, that you can run on the code to see if there are, there are problems with it. So, so we missed those. And the other thing is, there's still a lot of manual labors that's needed to actually do the, uh, to do the bi to bisect the output and also report the problem to a mailing list. Yeah. So we try, so starting, so this is kind of the kernel status like at, in 2011. Um, so most of the, the, the QA is kind of done ad hoc in the maintainers uh, upstream trees that they will do the unit testing and relies on the submitter of the patches to, make, uh, to do the, the testing before they submit. 
And also the distributions, like Suze, Red Hat, Ubuntu, they, they have their QA guys, and they do some testing. Um, however, they, they only focus on the, the release versions, but not necessarily catch problems in the upstream version. And the other things that we rely a lot on is actually all the users. Linux has a huge, humongous like, user base, and those are all the testers. So if there's problems, they, um, the problems are reported back fairly quickly. Um, and, and the main maintainers usually are fairly good in responding to the problem. So this is kind of how Linux does its QA at that time. So, <clears throat> there are some tools like KTAS that, that, that do auto bisects of like kernels and all that. But, but it's not done in, um, nobody is actually run, do, uh, running the task and doing it on a regular basis. It's all kind of ad hoc. And I, I'll show you a, a flame mail from Linus. Like, this is actually a, a colleague of mine is the maintainer of the uh, AC, ACPI subsystems. And <clears throat> Linus was not really happy with him and complained that Oh gosh! Like you, you asked me to merge this bunch of code and doesn't even compile. <laughs> so said, it clearly had zero testing, and yeah, and he was really embarrassed about it. Yeah. <clears throat> so how do we? So we want to do better. Yeah. So <clears throat> the our the thing we want us to do is to move our testing like, from the release candidates now up to where uh, into the, all the subsistence maintainers trees. That's where all the new patches first get merged. Um, so we want us to detect any problems like, right after merge. And we also want us to uh, add uh, tests for uh, kernel buildings and also kernel bootings and all those, all those good stuff. <clears throat> so we want to do the we so we changed the name of our project from kernel performance testing to zero day testing because we want to uh, start testing uh, the the day that uh, the new patches are merged uh, into uh, uh, the kernel trees. <clears throat> Trying to do it really early. So here are some goals that we um, set for ourselves. We want to fully automate say, all the tasks to detect uh, build, boot, and performance problems. And the other thing is we want to automate the, the bisection uh, of problems. And we want to also automate the validation uh, problems because a lot of the time when, when you have a change in performance, you actually need to go back and run that benchmark many times to make sure that that, that problem is, is indeed there and not just due to some run variation. So we want to automate that process. And the fourth thing we want to automate is we want to automate the report of, of the problem. Yeah. <clears throat> um, if you want to keep up with the changes, uh, you can't really realize uh, just on on the, um, the the testers to go and report the problems to the mailing list. Uh, you need to automate that somehow. Okay, so it's, these are kind of four goals we set for ourselves. <clears throat> so um, we we built uh, the systems here, and we have a local uh, Git mirror that mirrors all the uh, maintainers trees. And once once uh, we actually look at the tree every hour. Yeah. <clears throat> when we detect the changes, say, we, we actually kick off the build on it. Um, and, and then if there's any build errors, say, we will uh, collect the, the information. If it's built properly, then we will kick it uh, on uh, virtual machines, actually. Yeah. Because... <clears throat> Using virtual machines to do your testing will expand the number of test boxes you have like, by a factor of like, the number of CPUs you've got in that box. So that's, that's a great, great things to have. And also to accommodate <coughs> uh, the fact that uh, Linux actually not just has x86 architecture, but also have other 
kind of architectures, but we don't actually have a, a lot of boxes for those. So we, we, we use an emulator, uh, Qume, uh, yeah, to, to run boot uh, for those, arch those other architectures. So we can de detect uh, boot problems for those. Yeah. <coughs> and I'll show you a picture of our, the lab we have. Say, and we have uh, uh, one built servers that's dedicated for our own internals and uh, Intel's uh, developments, and 10 built servers for all the community code. And, and then we have like 40 test boxes uh, that, that runs uh, per performance tests and also say, boot tests and, and all that. And we, we also have like, two test boxes that act as uh, test controllers to decide um, um, what. Uh, what tasks what, uh, to run, and what kernels to build, and what config options to use, and all that stuff. <clears throat> so we started the, the, the projects in uh, 2011. So each dot here represents a one day. Okay. So you can see that between uh, 3.1 kernel and 3.3 kernels, there there are quite a lot of build errors there, yeah. And so when we, after we started the, the project that really comes into full swings about in the 3.5 time frames, things have improved uh, uh, re really tremendously. And the reason is because we are able to catch all the build errors in, before it goes into the uh, Linus tree. We are able to catch all the build errors uh, in all the maintainers trees uh, when when it first got merged. <clears throat> and um, also, we uh, we do boot test, and this is kind of uh, typical, very typical output from our boot test. Uh, we will <coughs> um, the the output will, will say, okay, we are comparing like this commit like with this base versions and we see that for the base versions like we are able to boot successfully 30 times but on on that versions uh, like we try to boot 110 times and 110 times it failed yeah and then we also catch uh, captures the the output of the error logs and say oh it's, so it's a null pointers like reference like when, when it boots up, say, oops, because it's trying to access an null pointer. <clears throat> and I'll show you actually a, um, some build error reports, and this is live, okay? And this is, I'll show you one build error report that, of my own, own patch that, that I tried to submit uh, uh, on Monday, okay? Let's see, whoops. Um. Ah, okay, here we go. So this this is the uh, the build errors. Like this is our we have a build robot that spit out this uh, error. It detects the build error and then it 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 will send. Uh, an email to the guy who actually uh, uh, sent out the patch and also to the maintainers uh, who actually have the, the patch in the tree. <clears throat> and it looks kind of like that. Uh, it complains that, oh, um, like this, this structures, I don't have this uh, uh, member root do domain. I'm trying to modify the, the schedulers. And and then it's point out the problem is right, right there. Yeah. And, and the reason was because I was testing only on uh, SMP machines, right? machines that has more than one course. So I didn't try the config that of machines that has uh, only single cores. And nowadays, you don't find uh, many machines with only a single core, but Linux still supports those. And when the, when you're, when the um, uh, built robot tries to test that config, it, it find, finds, finds the errors, and then send the mail back to me. So I actually had the, the patch merged on Monday, uh, Monday night, 
And on Tuesday morning when I go, go, go into work, I actually got this email in my mailbox telling me that the, uh, the, the, the problem is there. So it got fixed very quickly yeah, uh, by, uh, uh, by, and the fix is pretty simple. Just, just uh, protect this code uh, under the config SMP. That, that's all, all there is. But, but we are able to fix this like, within a day, which, yeah, which is great. And I will also show you, um, anybody wants to guess that how many build errors uh, or boot errors that we, we caught um, for the month of June so far? Anybody want to take a guess? <laughs> 50? OK, any other guess? 100? <laughs> okay, not 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 of them, not all of them. I thought. Okay, I'll, just, I'll click on those, and this is our, all the errors, and let's see. Yeah, June two thousand fourteen. Yeah, from Sunday, June first to Thursday, June twenty sixth. So about five hundred sixty two of them. Yeah. So this is something you cannot do without. Uh, uh, a test robot, okay, and and you can click. We we have it all archived. Like these are just mails that we we send out. So it's a mailing mailing list that that we maintain. So it's all. If you are interested, uh, you can go to our website and, and look at that. And we can just like click on any of those. Yeah, this is a very typical um, error report. Says that, oh. Your array index in the initializer exceeds array bounds. <laughs> so th things like that, yeah. And you'll be amazed at uh, how many how many errors that 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 you you get in a, in a month. Like this all goes into the maintainer's tree. And if we don't catch it right there, it will propagate down downstream, and eventually, yeah, it will cause problems somewhere. Okay. Uh, okay, I'll show you another. Is that's a boot error example? Let's see. <coughs> Here, here's a boot uh, boot errors that that we caught. Yeah. So this is uh, very typical. So this this portion here tells you the the tree where where uh, uh, where we are doing the testing. This is from. Uh, the uh, network file system that maintainers said that's, that's his tree said. And then he was uh, doing this change, and we found that um, we have, when we boot the system uh, with, with this, this change here, it's like there's uh, um, we whoops. And the, the reason for the whoops was, and this, this shows you the, the call stacks. Um, and also IP pointers and all, all, all kinds of good stuff where you need to debug the problems. And down here is the uh, kind of the bi bisect log that I was I was talking about. Say it, the robot actually go, goes and do the bisect itself and actually show the history of, of the bisect. <clears throat> and also tells gives all the, the boot, the entire uh, boot uh, startups, like logs, like information, the, all the D messages. It shows that. And QU, right? What? Is this running on a QU? Yeah, uh, it's running in KVM, actually. This one is KVM, yeah. And the, the entire config. Uh, config options for for the kernel and what, yeah. So you can very easily um, reproduce the problems. Well, we even give the scripts that you can run to reproduce the errors. Say it's a shell scripts that run the uh, uh, Q, QMU. Uh, yeah, then and you can run that and then reproduce the errors. <laughs> <clears throat> so, this will allow the uh, um, 
the originator of the patch and also is the, the maintainer is to fix the problems very quickly yeah, with, with all this information. Okay. <coughs> uh, also shows you some uh, performance regressions. So this is uh, kind of the, uh, the data that we get when, when our test robots go and do, do the testing. I will come back and show us uh, some graphs, uh, graphs like that, and it will say that it goes and tries to do the uh, bisect um, and found that, oh, the, the bad commit is, is right here in this patch. And this is kind of the history of the, of the, the bisections and say that on the, on the good bisects, like the throughput is over here, but on the bad, bad bisect, the throughput go down by uh, 4,000 megabit per second, uh, yeah. So once again, I'll show you an example. Say. So uh, this, is, this, this was last year. Say. We found that the, uh, the TCP streaming actually goes down by 27%. And uh, it, so we detect the problem on October 21st and reported it on October 22nd, and we fixed it, and it was fixed on October 23rd. So I'll show you the kind of the history here. So, so we, we, <coughs> we found, found the problem, so we sent the mail to the, um, the maintainers. That we, we complained that, oh yeah, we saw a big net perf throughput regression. So it goes down by, 27 percent to forty something percent. Okay, and this is this is the patch that's causing the problem. Okay, go look at it. Yeah, and if you go further down, so this is a bisect history. Okay, of, and then there is a ASCII graph that shows the change between the the throughput. This is this is the good throughput and this is the bad throughput. So you can see that there is uh, <coughs> a lot of uh, uh, regressions. That we also give other kind of information uh, too to help the uh, developers try to find out what the problem is. Uh, so we give um, the VM stat, um, like this is contact, Contact switching rates uh, and also log statistics. Uh, what else? Usually, the the validation systems it will it will um, when when it find the uh, the patch that's causing a problem, it will actually move up to the good good commit. And then runs a bunch of times and compare it with the back commit. It runs a bunch of times, and <clears throat> the number of times we re repeat uh, the, the test also depends on the the nature of the test. Some tests inherently has more variations. Like IOs like that inherently has more more variation in it. So for those, we actually need to run it a lot more. Yeah. Some some tests are very stable, and then we don't need to run run as many, but we do keep track on the, uh, the the test variations to decide how many times we have to repeat the test. Yeah. Is all the GoBot testbot codes open source or available? Or all <coughs> um, I, unfortunately, we we haven't open sourced that, that code yet. Yeah. Um, we are trying to. <laughs> Okay, our our original version was written in Bash Bash scripts, but for this l new versions, the uh, the zero day versions, we we actually develop in Ruby. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I need to go faster. Okay. Yeah. So um, these are. We actually collect a lot more uh, statistics uh, as we run run the tests. Like these are 
um, system profiles that we maintain, like uh, for example, VM stats, lab info, log statistics, and much more. And there's a lot of things you can track. Yeah, so I show you some of the things. Say, like, for example, boot time. Say, like, just to see how how long it takes. Uh, this is between 3.11 and the uh, the. 3.12 release candidate 5. So we can see the, <clears throat> the boot times has kind of gone, gone up, regressed uh, below. And also the, the code size has <laughs> gone up too. Yeah. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> and um, most of the tasks that uh, you, you run it in some kind of uh, bash shell scripts. But we have a test configurations and that stores in some YAML file. And those, those stores the parameters that we use that to run the test and also controls the, um, uh, the, the profile statistics that we are trying to uh, maintain. And the, there are also some issues that we have to face. Uh, we, we run about uh, 5,000 tests uh, each day. Uh, and then we have to decide if if we see some performance changes, um, then we have to decide should we go in and start doing bisect. But doing actually bisect and rerunning the test to val to verify the performance changes those takes quite a lot of time. Sometimes you need to to run for two hours or or more. Uh, so we cannot do every we cannot start bisecting for every performance changes we see. So we have to choose uh, a few to bisect. And here are some of the criteria that we decide. First is like, perform, uh, the percentage change. Obviously, like, if you see sees your, your locks acquisitions goes, goes up by a factor of nine versus uh, your system times goes up by just a little bit, you, you go after your, the, 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 the lock acquisition problem first. Yeah. <clears throat> the other thing is variation. How reliable is the, is the task? Like if, a, if a task has a lot of variations versus uh, another task that's, that's kind of very stable, then we'll do the stable test first. Yeah. Run time, that we try to bisect those, those uh, benchmark that runs very fast, do that first. <clears throat> and also, how important are the statistics? Yeah, throughput is the most important one, so we usually go after that first. Um, also, timeliness. We usually try to bisect the, the most recent uh, problems that we see first. Uh, those, those are more, um, uh, like more, more critical to address, and, but we do reserve some bandwidth um, for the systems to go and look at the older problems, but usually we give priority to the most recent changes. <clears throat> so this is where we are right now. So we have uh, about uh, one hour response time. So we do the test on the Git trees uh, every hour. Um, and we look at, uh, we monitor over 400 uh, Git trees. Yeah. And usually, we are able to catch about 30 boot, boot bugs like, per month and about 600 build, build bugs, yeah. and about 10 performance regressions per month. So this, this has a big uh, community, community impact. And the Linux kernel build failures uh, used to be at 6.5% for the mainline. Uh, now it's down to about 0.1%. Yeah. <coughs> so in conclusions, yeah, if you deal with any open source projects, change is something you have to live with. Yeah. And regression is just part of life. So you have to think of some, some way to deal with it. Uh, to, to, you have to design some, some kind of a test systems uh, to find out those regressions. Um, and you should try to catch the problems before the, the error is baked into your system where it's hard to change. Yeah, try to catch it er as early as possible. And Git and bisect is, is your friend. So if you, if you are not using Git to, maintain, uh, to uh, 
uh, manage your systems and God be with you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And also, you, uh, you can use virtual machines say, to do your testing. Say. This will really increase the number of test boxes you have. Yeah. And try as much as possible automate your test environment. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.